Okay. Let's try that again. Continuing with the Halloween themes. Uh, I have to start with this because, you know, nerd. Even a man who is pure in heart and says his prayers by night may become a wolf when the wolf bane blooms and the autumn moon shines bright. Anybody remember that movie? Yeah. The original wolf man? Ron Chaney. Claude Rains, who was also the invisible man, by the way. <laughs> and that was uh, the gypsy woman speaking to him, revealing to him for two that he was cursed. And uh, to get to where I'm going with for the werewolves, I need, we need to go through a couple of uh, theological concepts. So I'm going to give you a big theological word that you can show off with this week, if you want. Uh, first is, I chose this uh, section of Paul's writings because he has this mixture of words that he kind of throws around a lot, and one of them is body, and one of them is flesh and the other is mind or will and for Paul he, this, the word body is one of those things that he kind of jumbles around with flesh but at least for him the body is redeemable and at times it's you know the temple of the Lord right flesh on the other hand is sin it's the drive to sin in us. And then will is that which we have that gets us to be obedient to God. He is not the first one to think in these terms. These are old thoughts that go back to Jewish understandings. Uh, one of the Yatzer Hara and the Yatzer Hatav. Uh, the evil inclination and the good inclination. The thing about the evil inclination that we have to understand is that it's not necessarily or really a terrible thing. It can become a terrible thing, but the evil inclination is those things that are in us that are based on survival. Okay, so we have to eat, we have to drink water, drink water please. We have, you know, we have to procreate to keep the species going, we need to sleep. All of these things are embedded in us and are necessary for our physical survival. The problem is when that's what we indulge. And so like five of the seven deadly sins can be <laughs> directly related to instead of uh, just eating to maintain health and maintain our bodies, we give way to gluttony. Drinking can give way to drunkenness. Uh, the need to acquire turns into greed. Then we have envy when we want somebody else's stuff. We have lust and we have sloth when we try to sleep too much. And as a direct result of, of that behavior and these seven deadly sins and Paul's writings, you get a lot of religions, and especially using Paul's writings, you get a lot of Christian groups that deny themselves any pleasures. They call themselves ascetics. And they deny themselves these pleasures because of the temptation to give in to them and lead to gluttony or whatever it might be. Some of them go so far as to um, have rituals which they will, they call chastising the flesh. And so they will, in prayer, they'll get out little flails and whip themselves in the back because the flesh is evil. And so it, being in the flesh is a punishment, so they're punishing themselves. And the key to all of that is giving in to the pleasure that we get from these activities and then just getting in the habit of pursuing them over anything else. 
So we start with natural urges or the physical needs that we have, eating, drinking, sleeping, etc. And the pleasure gained creates an increased desire to feel it again. And here's where you get your big theological term for the day. It's called concupiscence. Which means a great longing or desire for something. Later on, they would throw in a word like wantonness to describe it. But what happens is eventually, or what can happen, is eventually our will becomes irrelevant. Even higher order desires like doing good have no effect on our behavior. There is only the desire and it must be satisfied. Hence, the werewolf. Like we talked about zombies last week, we can talk about traits and characteristics of werewolves. The victim of, or hero or anti-hero of those movies is usually, especially in the older ones, uh, bitten or scratched while hunting another werewolf. So Lord John Talbot in that very first wolf man was just come back from America where he was hunting a werewolf. But he got scratched in that process and so infected. And what's funny about that is that it's literally him condemning the behavior of another person, literally condemning that person to death for behaviors that are inside all of us. Which, in direct contrast with a zombie bite, is usually something, rather than pursuing and hunting them, you get bitten when you're trying to run from them. So. And then, when that first full moon comes, they cannot resist the transformation. The animal is released against their will. And as a result, the werewolf is unrecognizable. They lose themselves. It's, fu it's funny because if you, as you watch them, often the next day they have no memory of what happened the night before. What happened, huh? And it, that sounds a lot like, it's probably more like you see in movies and, and reading books, but I'm sure it happens in real life too, like when a drug addict a loved one of a drug addict or an alcoholic looks at them and says, I don't know who you are anymore. You are unrecognizable to the person I once knew. And where a zombie feeds mindlessly and just kind of ambles around and does nothing, just shuffles around when no food is present, there's no drive to go look for it. But if it shows up, they're more than happy to. But a werewolf hunts. Hunts with the intention of satisfying the hunger. And the transformation happens at night, so the hunting can be done under cover of darkness. I have, to, I have to tell you that in, in researching these things, one thing that made me laugh was uh, a more modern trend going on with the werewolf is to have them uh, happen to younger people, saying that it is a metaphor for puberty. <laughs> so hair growing in places, you know, everywhere, you know, things going off, being wild, doing silly things. But we all, kind of, we all do that. We all have these things. We can all give in to that or yearn for it. We're all susceptible to the behavior. But unlike the zombie from last week and next week we're doing vampires, 
There is always hope for the werewolf. The werewolf could be saved if they just recall themselves fully. If they just remember who they are and what they're about. Regain their self-control. Their will to act or not. What you know the weakness of a werewolf is? Silver? Did you know that silver is another way you can save a werewolf? Not necessarily, it kills the werewolf. It doesn't necessarily kill the human, though it often does in the books and movies, but silver throughout history is known as being a purifier. They found old urns uh, lined with silver. And science has shown that silver pitchers and stuff like that will kill bacteria, viruses, and fungi in the water just by pouring it into a silver container. And biblically, when they talk about refining silver, they talk about it for the purpose of purification. Whereas refining gold is for the purpose of redemption. And in one uh, Jewish folk tale, there's a boy who goes to speak to uh, a silversmith, and he talks about refining the silver. And the boy asks, how do you know when it's pure? And he says, I know the purifying is complete when I can see my reflection in the silver. As though to see the reflection of God in ourselves is that sign of purification. So there is hope for the werewolf. There is a, an opportunity, a chance for purification, for release. Just come to yourself. Come to your senses. Exert your will again. Don't just give in to whatever hunger is driving you. And unlike Paul who is often inclined to believe that we are powerless against it, against the flesh and its desires. In fact, just a few verses before this, he says, I don't know why I do the things I don't want to do and don't do the things I do want to do. It sounds a little bit like an emo rock song or something like that. And that it just has no control over it. I don't hold to that. I'm, I'm more in agreement with Peter. Who says, your, your adversary prowls around like a roaring lion. Or maybe a wolf. Seeking someone to devour. But resist him. Being firm in your faith. God's grace has the power to help us recall ourselves to who we really are and whose we really are. And God has taught us through scripture, through law, through tradition and experience, God has taught us how to control the werewolf possibility in all of us. Because you have to admit, it's very easy to give in. You know why they call it temptation? Because you want it. 
You are not tempted by things you do not want. I am not tempted to eat raw tomatoes. Just not. <laughs> Put a cheesecake in front of me. <laughs> Different story. But if we didn't want these things, they wouldn't be temptation. We, are all, we all have these things that tempt us and draw us away from our true selves, from our true will, just to satisfy some hunger. But we can control it. That phrase that Peter used echoes actually uh, Genesis 4. Where God is speaking to Cain and asking him why he's so angry. It says sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you, but you can master it. Who will set me free from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ our Lord. I think that's... Let's leave it at an amen. Before I get too preachy.